Hello, my name is Napoleon McClinton, and thank you for joining us for our Sunday School lesson study today. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day that you have made and for this opportunity, Father, to participate in the study of your holy word. We pray, Father, that you would help us to set aside any cares and concerns that we might have, that we may focus our hearts and mind on the lesson scripture, that we may look deeply and intently into your word, that we may find practical applications for our daily lives. We thank you, Father, for you have watched over us and kept us safe. We thank you, Father, for the many, many blessings that you have bestowed upon our lives. We thank you, Father, for your darling son, Jesus, who because of his death, his burial, and his resurrection, Father, now through faith in him, Father, we can be reconciled back to you. We pray, Father, that you would bless those that are sick, those that are afflicted, those that are suffering from the loss of some loved one. Our prayer, Father, is that you would comfort them with the comfort that you know how, and that, Father, only you can provide that comfort. We pray that you would use us, Father, as your instruments of glory, that we may say a kind word or do a good deed to help lift someone's spirits, Father, and that we will be the, the ones that would point them toward your son, Jesus. We pray, Father, for our, our church, our church leaders. We pray for our communities and our community leaders. We pray for our city, state, county, and federal leaders. Our prayer, Father, is that, Father, you would have them to know that you have called them to be your children and you have put them in positions of responsibility. Help them, Father, to take the responsibility that you have given them serious. And help them to know, Father, that you are the ruler of all the universe. And that, Father, you are the one that calls men to be put in position and women to be put in position. But you put them there, Father, that they may honor you and bring glory to your name. Help us to live up to your expectations in life, Father, and to do that which is pleasing in your sight. We thank you for your son, Jesus, Father and the many blessings that his life has brought upon us. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Well, thank you again for joining us for our study today. As we continue in our 2020 fall uh, quarter, and we've been talking from the topic for the quarter of love for one another. And so today's lesson is the October 11th lesson, and it's lesson six. And so on the screen, you'll see our agenda for today. A lesson outline is taken from a lesson six, Love for Enemies, as we look at Luke's Gospel, chapter six, verses 27 through 36. And we have two outlines for today. The first outline is Love for Enemies, from Luke, chapter six, verses 27 through 30. And then our second outline is love for all, Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 31 through 36. And all our scripture reading will come from the New International Version of the Bible, the NIV. And so with that in mind, let's look at our scripture for today. Love for enemies is really what the title of the scripture is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 27 through 36. We find these words on the screen. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. If and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. 
And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. And so our lesson context, which you'll also see on the screen, uh, we're looking at unit two, which is entitled Inclusive Love uh, for the entire month of October. And our lesson for the day is the October 11th lesson, lesson six, which is, which is entitled Love for Enemies. As we look at Luke's gospel, chapter six, verses 27 through 36. And so let's look at our context. And our context is intended to help us build some background around the lesson studied for today and to try to bring us up to date as to where we're studying from. We began in the sixth chapter of Luke, so let's look at some background information regarding that. And it's entitled, uh, Love for Enemies. So Luke's chapter six contains an account of what has traditionally been called the Sermon on the Plain. Much attention has been given over the years to the relationship between the Sermon on the Plain and Matthew's account of the Sermon on the Mount. The difference between these two sermons are readily apparent. One was delivered on a mountain, the other one on a plain. The Sermon on the Plain is about one-fourth or one-quarter the length of the Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes open the Sermon on the Mount, and it contains blessings only. The Sermon on the Plain opens with fewer blessings that are followed by a set of correspondent woes. Both sermons show great concern for the poor and socially outcast, and teaching love for enemies. The centrality of mercy in the nature of the kingdom and opposition to hypocrisy. In Luke chapter 6, the Sermon on the Plain comes on the heels of a controversy with the Pharisees, after which Jesus left to pray on a mountain. Prayer on this occasion preceded Jesus' choosing of the twelve apostles. After that, Jesus came down to the plain. When Jesus opened his mouth to speak, looking at his disciples, he said, and that was seen in Luke chapter 6, verse 20, it was the disciples, those who were already committed in word and deed to follow the Lord, who were the primary audience for what he had to say. Others were present as we see the peoples there, the people in Luke chapter 6, verse 19, but they were overhearing a message directed to Jesus' disciples, not directed to others in the crowd. Jesus was describing the nature of the kingdom in these verses. He painted a picture of the church that he was forming around him and its way of life. These words are still not directed at outsiders or at the word at large. The Sermon on the Plain opens with a series of blessings and woes. Jesus says, it is the poor and hungry, the bereft and the persecuted that are truly blessed. They can look forward to unimaginable blessings on the last day. And so we see Jesus now in the, our lesson outline, our lesson scripture for today, as he introduces this concept of love for enemies. Now that is obviously not a normal human concept. And so let's just look at how Jesus teaches his disciples, those that had chose to follow him, and that would include us if we are disciples of Jesus. So let's look at what he says in verse 27 of Luke's gospel chapter six. And he's explaining how and what we ought to return for hatred. 
He says, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. The phrase here, but to you who are listening, is equivalent to a phrase that Jesus also has used in Mark's gospel and Matthew gospel. When he says, whoever has ears, let them hear. So hearing requires that we understand as well as we obey uh, that which we hear of Jesus. And so it's about a willingness to transform one's life in accordance with the demands of the message of Jesus. The believer who is growing spiritually becomes increasingly able to extend love to enemies. Love is defined as an action, uh, as we see here when he says, do good to those who hate you, not sentiment or feeling. Love costs something. It costs the one that is giving the love something. Love does not come cheap, which is what we see in verse 27b, when Jesus says, do good to those who hate you. And so he lays out here, as we look at verse 28, uh, how we can uh, love our enemies and how, what we, how we can return uh, love and not return hate to them, which is a normal human inclination. So let's look at what Jesus says in, in verse 28 when he tells us to bless and pray. He says, bless those who curse you. And pray for those who mistreat you. So Jesus now is calling for his disciple, which includes us, those that have come out of the darkness into Jesus' marvelous light, to demonstrate love in our speech toward one another by blessing those who curse us. The natural inclination for us, if you curse me, I, I'm going to curse you back. But Jesus is now in his kingdom. He's teaching us to demonstrate love in our speech by blessing those who curse us and praying for those who mistreat us in verse 28. And what we do is we honor Jesus' command when we pray for anyone who has caused us pain. Now, that is not human nature. Obviously, that is uh, God's nature. That is the nature of the indwelling Holy Spirit. So that is supernatural nature. And I know we're probably thinking, I guess I'm not there. Well, I tell you right now, I'm not either. And probably none of us are there yet. But we're talking about those that have chose to follow Jesus and that have been indwelled by his Holy Spirit and that is allowing his Holy Spirit to lead and to guide us as we grow each day in our lives through prayer, through study, and to meditate on God's word. And so now Jesus points out here, in verse uh, 29 and verse 30, he calls for us to be forgiving and to be generous toward our enemies. Look what he says here in verse uh, 29. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. So Jesus now is teaching about a love that calls for us to demonstrate and to go beyond the human standards. The disciples of Jesus should offer the other cheek uh, also after being struck on one cheek in verse 29a. Jesus' standards are based on God's own character and conduct. Jesus himself modeled exactly what he is preaching. Uh, as we look at Matthew Gospel, chapter 26, verse 36 through chapter 27, verse 50, when Jesus was taken by the soldiers and he was carried through those king of room courts, and ultimately he was placed on the cross to be crucified. The Bible says that he, 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 he said not a mumbling word. And that he, even in death, Jesus asked the Father, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they're doing. And so love for our enemies extends uh, to our attitude toward our possessions as well. Other words, Jesus is pointing out here again uh, as we read verse 29b. 
Disciples of Christ are not to be stingy with our things because they are not ours to begin with. We are just stewards of whatever God has placed in our care. And so what we want to do is be good stewards so that God will tell us one day, well done, thy good and faithful servant. So we should trust God's provision enough to not expect to be repaid for what we give in verse 30. Jesus points this out. Jesus' messianic self-understanding did not match up with the expectations of the crowd uh, who had who for, uh, when he came as the Messiah. The crowd other, otherwise had a different expectation of Jesus as the Messiah. They were looking for a, 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 a human being that would ultimately one day free them from oppression. And so when they saw Jesus doing all of these miracles in John's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 14 through 15, they wanted to make him a king immediately. But that was not why Jesus came this time. He came this time as a suffering servant. He came this time as one that would teach us about the way of the kingdom that ultimately he would bring about one day. And so now we look at his second outline, our second outline, as we look at Luke's gospel, chapter 6, verses 31 through 36. And Jesus now is not only calling us to love for our enemies, but we ought to have a love for all. And obviously, we are not talking about a human love. We're talking about a supernatural love. We're talking about an agape type love, a love that is concerned about people in spite of how they treat us, in spite of their concern for us. So look what he says in verse 31, and we'll see that on the screen. He's talking about a standard that is above average. He's talking about a heavenly standard that he brings about uh, in, his, in his kingdom. Look what he says in verse 31. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. So in the first part of our discussion from Luke chapter 6, verse 27 through 30, Jesus was describing specific behaviors that characterized the kingdom that Jesus had come to establish. But now in our second outline in Luke chapter 6, verses 31 through 36, Jesus speaks to the motivation for those behaviors. And so the focus now is on treating, uh, treatment of all people in general. It includes everyone with whom believers interact. So verse 31 is commonly called the golden rule and is an expansion of, from the Old Testament law, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, where it said we ought to love our neighbors uh, as we love ourselves. And Jesus teaches that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12 also. And when he uses the phrase sinners here, he's referring to all those who operate on normal human terms with regard to personal relationships, exchanges, and so forth, we see in verse 32. Though uh, they love those who love them, that's the worldly way. We love those who love us. We do good unto those who do good unto us. And so we believe in, from our human mindset that we ought to do unto others as they do unto us. In other words, we're not practicing the kind of agape love, the love in spite of that Jesus is proclaiming here in the Sermon on the Plain. And so Jesus calls his disciples to go beyond this limit and this limiting standard that we have set for ourselves as human standard. Jesus' disciples are called to a higher standard. And that's one that Jesus says that must surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. 
when he repeats that or he quotes that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. So we see Jesus' Sermon on the Plain in verse 32 also lines up with his teaching in the Sermon on the Mountain in Matthew Gospel chapter 5, verse 20. So Jesus envisions the end of merely repaying good for good. He looks beyond that, that we repay, we repay good for good, but we also go beyond that, that we try to do good even to those that do evil to us. And I know that's tough. I know that's probably what you're saying. As we look around our country today, we don't really want to see good things happen to bad people. But God tells us, and I think we have to trust God that he is in, in control and that God's will will be done. And, and, and our hatred for one another does not bring about the will of God. And so now Jesus here in verse uh, 33, we go and see that good should be shown to others just for the sake of good. We ought to do good just because that's what we ought to do and not for the sake of anything that we might receive in return. We see that in verse 33. So the way of life expounded by Jesus makes demands on those who would follow him. And that's who he was talking to in this sermon on the plain. He was talking to those 12 apostles that he had just called and named. He was talking to those disciples had, who had professed to follow him and to obey him. And so he's talking to you and I today because it's in Jesus' name that we, we move and we live and we have our being. It's because we are ambassadors for Jesus and we represent his teaching. And that's what ought to be in our lives. And so here, the way of life expounded by Jesus makes demands on those who would follow him. The man's that fall outside the boundaries of normal human relationship and cultural expectations. We see that in verse 34. The kingdom of God is marked by a new approach to human relationship that explodes our ideas about status, our ideas about our possessions, and what we believe we are entitled to, and many other subjects we see Jesus lay out here in verse 34. And so what he's saying that if we're going to love, have love for all, we're going to have to have an above average standard of dealing with uh, our relationships. And we're going to have to be acting like God's children. And we see that in our last outline for the day as we look at verse 35 through 36. And so let's read that also on the screen. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. So verse 5 is sort of a summary statement for the entire passage that, passage that we have been studying. And Jesus repeat this idea throughout his teaching. As a matter of fact, love is the dominant behavior in the New Testament. And so we want to practice that kind of behavior. That is love for all people and love for our enemies. And so what he's saying here is to be children of the Most High, Jesus' disciples, which includes us, are called to do the same thing that God does especially loving our enemies. Paul writes in Romans 5, verses 10 through 11, he talks about that while we were yet enemies, Christ died for the ungodly. And so Christ sacrificed his life so that you and I could be part of his family. So Jesus was clearly stressing that the ability to love others is a self, in a self-sacrificial manner is an important component of our eternal reward. We see that in verse 35b. Now, we don't, it's not by works that we are saved. The Bible says, for it is by faith through grace that we are saved, right? It's because of God's grace. So we didn't deserve what God did for us when he died on the cross and allowed us to have life and to have it more abundantly. But God now wants us to grow in spiritually and to be set apart for his purpose. 
And so this kind of love that Jesus is talking about is a vital part of our identity as the children of the Most High. In other words, if we're God's children, then we ought to have some examples in our life being manifested in the world today. And the motivation for living a certain kind of life is not based on what we can get out of it or what we can get in the here and now. Obviously, we, 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 we don't really expect to be rewarded for the things that we do for Christ because ultimately Christ has a reward uh, waiting on us in heaven when we do go to heaven or when he die or when we or when he comes back. And so God's character is is kind even to the people who are ungrateful and wicked. Jesus says that God causes his rain to fall on the just and the unjust. And so God is a merciful God. God's character is our ultimate example. And our desire is to please God uh, is our ultimate motivation for doing godly things, for loving our enemies, and for doing good to those that hate us. So our lives should imitate our Heavenly Father, is what Jesus is pointing out in verse 35. And so the disciples, which also includes us, and don't let us think that this is talking about somebody else. It's also talking about all of us that profess our faith in Jesus Christ. We are called to be merciful toward each other and toward one another, just as our Heavenly Father has been merciful toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ came and he died for the ungodly. And so in concluding our lesson today regarding Jesus' teaching, we see these words on the screen. That Jesus' teaching, the Sermon on the Mountain, or the Sermon on the Plain, is not a difficult passage to understand. This is not a difficult passage to understand. I mean, clearly when he says, love your enemies and do good to those that mistreat you, you understand what he's saying. The problem is, it is an exceedingly difficult passage to put into practice, we see in our conclusion. This is because the way of life that Jesus described in the Sermon on the Plain runs counter to the fundamentals of human nature. We have a deep-seated desire for revenge. Clearly, we want to give and go back and quote the Old Testament, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But Jesus explained that he teaches us a better way. And we want to get redress, a redress for injustices and for the respect of others. And so it is common to view Jesus' teaching or the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Plain as impractical and unrealistic, even among Christians, and to seek ways to get around the implication of Jesus' word. The truest and best applications we may make of Jesus' words is simply to reject the worldly way of thinking, thus clearing the godly way for his words about love of enemies to reshape our hearts and our lives. So our thought to remember is that Jesus does. He calls us to live a new way of life. And Paul puts it like this in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and that we ought to be a living sacrifice. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will, from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So let us pray. Father in heaven, we understand clearly what you are teaching us in the Sermon on the Plain. For as you said, and as they said in the Sermon on the Mountain, Matthew Gospel uh, chapter 7, that he taught us as one having understanding. And so we clearly understand what you're saying. The problem is, is it's difficult in our lives for us 
to try to do this in our own human body. We are called to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And the way our mind is to be renewed is through study and meditating on your holy word. Help us, Father, to put our faith and our trust in you, that you call us to be examples in this life and in this world that you have placed us in, that would demonstrate that we are our Father's children. Just as you are a merciful, Father, and you have shown mercy to us, you call us also to be merciful toward others. Even those that are our enemies and even those that are hate us, you call us to demonstrate our love for our enemies through the way we behave. Our behavior ought to be that of being endued and being guided by the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who because of his death, we have been saved from the penalty of sin. And we thank you for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because now through him living in our hearts and in our minds, we, Father, can be saved from the very presence of sin. And one day, Father, when you come back and when you bring us to be home with you, Father, we will be saved eternally, Father, in our heavenly home with you and your son, Jesus. In his precious name we pray, amen. God bless you is my prayer and be safe.